Hello, welcome to Code with JV AI snapshot number five. Meta have released Llama 2 and it is available for commercial use. This is going to make a massive difference in the world of open models because all the researchers have been building off Llama, which was leaked and not available for commercial use. Now the new better version is context length is 4,000 tokens. So it's a bit light compared to what you'll get out of OpenAI, but also that's pretty par for the course for open models. It is a censored model, which means it is safe to use in a business context. And they've done a lot of work stopping the model from doing bad stuff. It is beating other open models on benchmarks, according to Meta, released yesterday. I'm expecting that all the open models which have been built on Facebook are going to be upgraded to use this, and we're going to be able to start playing with them for real business applications. Meta have also released Chameleon, which is not just a text-to-image model, it's a bit more. Yes, it can do text images, but so can lots of other folks. Text guided image editing. This was the thing that really caught my eye. Put sunglasses on this person, change it in this way, make the sky bluer. Those kinds of directives that you would give to a designer, you can give to a model and it can update images for you. They haven't released the model yet, but it's a hint about the stuff that will be coming down the pipeline soon. Anthropic have done their public release of Claude and you can chat with it if you're in the US and the UK. You can get on a wait list somewhere else or maybe use a VPN if you want to pretend you're in those places. It's a good chatbot. But also, it doesn't do images, it doesn't do search, it doesn't do plugins, a lot of the stuff which is more interesting. Why would you use it as opposed to ChatGPT? It's got different pricing, but you still can't get into their API unless you accept it onto their beta program. I feel like this is an interesting story of a company which got a bunch of noticing. It's been around for a while, people have known about it because they've had their private beta program. When they do their public release, will it get traction? I don't know. But I think it's going to have to do a lot more than just another chatbot to compete against the Bards and the Bings and the open AIs of the world. And when they release the API, I will be right in there trying to see what it can do in terms of generating code. Bard have released a bunch of updates. The most notable one is they've integrated Lens, which means you can add images into your chat with Bard. A lot of the reports I've seen are that Bard still isn't that good compared to ChatGPT, and I'm not seeing people rave about it so much. But I think this gives you a, an idea of Bing and Bard both have image and text in there. I expect we'll see the same from GPT-4 sooner rather than later. Wix have gone and released a teaser for a full website builder with AI. They've got a video, go check it out. It's got a lot of just iterative prompting with an AI and then it builds you a website in Wix. What templates do you want, etc. It generates the images for you. It generates text for you. You can ask for revisions of it. It is a full package deal. The CEO has published some of their thoughts on their approach to AI, which is basically do everything with AI. Here's a list of all the stuff you can do already with AI, which is sort of like little pieces of it, like an AI generated domain names. You get an AI to brainstorm the domain names you want for your website. It's combining all these packages together to give people the experience of have a chatbot build a website for you, which will be interesting when it comes out. Bluehost are doing similar stuff with WordPress. I think this is a taste of the things to come, which is, hey, AI, do a task for me, do a complex task, whether it is editing images, edit this video, or create this video, or create this website, there's going to be more and more domains where you can go and start asking AIs to do stuff. And by iteratively chatting with them, you'll get a work product at the end of it, which is going to be a lot of fun to play with. Slightly different note, Petals is a new project. Think BitTorrent meets running a large language model. They're pitching it for, hey, you know these large models which you don't have the GPU power to run? Well, maybe if you plug your GPU into a swarm of other GPUs, you can run them in a distributed way. So they're building the tech for that, which is cool for open source folks who want to run the big models and don't want to pay for it and just want to share their GPUs with each other. But I think the consequence of this is it's also what unstoppable AI could look like. Imagine a bunch of people who have an AI model which other folks won't run and they just share their GPUs with each other, they can have the model work and be uncensored or biased in whatever way they want, and it will be as resilient as a BitTorrent swarm is, which is slightly scary. So this was fun. Hugging Face folks wrote a blog with a deep dive on the open LLM leaderboard, in particular, looking at one of the metrics MMLU. This was just a great insight into what goes on behind them. Essentially, the Falcon people and the Llama people ran the same benchmark, got different answers, because it sounds like there are three different implementations of this thing, and they all give different numbers. Here they started comparing all these models and seeing how well they did against different ones. This part here was quite interesting, just giving you an idea about how the different implementations did the evaluation. Just by having slight differences, such as does this have the word question in it? See, here are the choices. How are they 
you measuring the answers, etc. Here's the same questions in multiple choice, but slightly different prompts. The models perform differently on them. So that slight difference was enough to get quite significant differences in rankings, which the open model people who are building stuff and want to rank well, they kind of care about this. It's an interesting dive under the hood about how some of these benchmarks work. This was great. It's a performance leaderboard. When you go to the website, click this tab to get the view. I can't really link to it automatically. It is just a great visual overview of where some models stack up against each other. The further to the right, the slower the model. The higher up, the better the model on the benchmark they're looking at. The larger the model, the more memory it takes. See all these green ones? This is all the Llama stuff. Llama's been really performant, which is why it's so exciting to see Llama available for commercial use now and a better version of Llama coming out the door. It was just a really good way of viewing these three parameters and to give you a sense about how some of these models stack up with each other. New York City has got an anti-bias law for hiring algorithms. This has got obligations in there for companies to share what algorithms they're using if they're using them in hiring decisions, to benchmark them and they get fines about it, etc. I think it's really interesting to think about how do we go from now where we know models have got bias in them and they also hallucinate and make stuff up and we kind of work around it. But whenever you're using it to get data, you're going to have to provide the anti-bias perspective because the models won't do that for a long time. Will we see more regulation forcing people to think about this and pay attention to it? Who knows? I really liked this article. It was talking about the demixing revolution of AI. This goes into a bit of the history of some of these tools, which basically pull out or decompose music so that you can get the instrumental or the vocals or the harmonies, etc. You might have seen the headlines about John Lennon's last track. Well, they pulled out the vocals from a blended thing and they used that converted track to make a new production. This stuff's been getting better and the tech that's powering a lot of those videos you might have seen about famous singers singing songs they never wrote and weren't written until a long time after they weren't here anymore. Final one for today. This is a research paper. NERF is neural radiance fields, and essentially it is a different way of composing videos. Typically the tech looks like take lots of photos of something, feed those photos into a model, and the model learns how to represent that situation in 3D space. It could be a model of a teacup or it could be of a room. And this video is not a video. It is a 3D render, which is generated by a whole bunch of photos. The thing about this tech is that if you were trying to store all of the image data you'd need to do this, that I'm seeing things like you turn five gigabytes of data to three megabytes of data because it isn't saving all the image data. It is training a model to represent that image data. There's a lot of fancy stuff going behind it, but the main thing is this tech is getting better and it's getting faster and it's getting lighter. The impacts this is gonna have as we start to think about rendered environments and extended reality or augmented reality or virtual reality, that stuff is getting better week by week. All right, that's the snapshot for today. Like and subscribe if you want to see more of these. If you want to get it in your email, link is below. Take care.